You know, it's funny. I mentioned earlier that I had gone to the Negro League Baseball Museum a couple times. And I think on my last trip there, uh, you know, you can purchase different souvenir items. And so I purchased a long picture of that they have of the first Negro League All-Star game. Uh, and you see all these players lined up. And I had it sitting in my office for a long time, just rolled up. And I ran across it. I said, you know, I'm going to get this frame. This was only maybe about four months ago. And I took about three different things in to get framed. Uh, and there were two young guys behind the counter to do the framing, one black, one white. They are probably in their 30s. And of the things I had to get framed, that was the only thing that really mesmerized them. And they said, look at this. Oh, wait a minute, the first what? Not All-Star, first Negro League All-Star. And then they started trying to figure out who the players were, but they had a hard time figuring all that out. Uh, but it shows the impact of history, and I'm glad I finally got it in a frame so I can have it there in the house, and hopefully young people, when they come through, will ask some questions about it and know a little bit more about their history. Uh, now we're kind of saved, uh, I think, the best for last. Let's turn on this mic. Testing, testing, very good, excellent. We talked a lot about history, uh, but now we're going to hear sort of the real deal from uh, from folks who who either did it themselves or have a direct link to those who broke some barriers and made some history. Um, at this time, let me introduce first. And as I call their name, if they could just come up, I think some are in the audience, and uh, one may be behind stage and come up and take a seat up here with me. Uh, Ron Teasley. Ron. I'll say a little bit about them while they're getting situated there. Ron set records at Wayne State as a baseball player in the 1940s. He played in the Brooklyn Dodgers system and for the New York Cubans, and later returned to Detroit to coach baseball, basketball, and golf at his alma mater, Detroit Western. <laughs> Northwestern, I'm sorry, I'm looking right at Detroit Northwestern. Sorry, get it right. I, I, I know fo fo folks like to make sure you got their high school right. <laughs> it's like when you run into the Cast Tech folks, you know, and they think it was only Cast Tech. You know, no, there were other schools as well, but I know that pride is out there. Um, we also want to introduce and bring to the stage Joyce Stearns Thompson. Joyce. Joyce is the daughter of Norman Thomas Turkey Stearns, uh, who led the Detroit Stars in the 1920s and the 1930s. Turkey Stearns remains among the greatest baseball players to ever wear a Detroit uniform. And finally, Kevin Lloyd. I mean, Kevin's behind stage. Kevin's father, Earl Lloyd, became the first African-American to play in the NBA in the 1950s. He later played on the championship Syracuse Nationals before finishing his playing career with the Detroit Pistons and joining that organization. Earl Lloyd was also among the NBA's first African-American head coaches, leading the Pistons in 1971 through 1972. Please give them all a big round of applause. Uh, we're just going to have a conversation here. Ron, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I'm told, and you can tell me if we're right or not, that your 500 batting average still stands as oh, a Wayne... That's correct. As, as a record at Wayne State University. <laughs> That's been a lot of years that folks haven't broken that record. <laughs> that says an awful lot just unto itself. Um, you were trying to get into the pros before Jackie broke the color barrier. Um, I remember from the conversation I had with Buck O'Neill where he talked about the fact that he said he, 
he played with and knew players that, in his opinion, were better ball players than Jackie Robinson. But he was very careful to say that Jackie was the best African American ball player for breaking the color barrier because of what he had to endure and what he was able to take. Um, what was it like before Jackie broke that color barrier for those of you trying to get into the pros? Well, uh, it, it was difficult. Uh, uh, now, I, I, you have to remember that uh, when I was uh, trying to get into professional baseball, my goal was to get to play with the Negro League teams, mm -hmm. and uh, because they're still segregated. Absolutely. And uh, so, uh, when I when when uh, Bill, when uh, Will Robinson uh, made it possible for us to to go down to Vero Beach, Florida, for a tryout, that was uh, something very unexpected. And uh, but uh, that was our entrance into professional baseball. How difficult was he trying to get into the Negro Leagues? Uh, it was, it was, there was a lot of tough competition. It was very tough. But uh, let, let me go back a little bit. Okay. Uh, when I was in high school and I was in college, I was, I was playing exhibition games with Negro League teams out at uh, Dequinder Park on Six Mile and Dequinder. Uh, I was, I guess what you might call an emergency player. When, <laughs> when uh, I, was, I was like, what, uh, 14, 15 years old, and if a player did not show up, they would maybe put me in the game. Otherwise, I'd have my uniform on, I would just sit there and I would observe and uh, maybe coach. And I, I've got to see a lot of outstanding baseball players. And teams uh, like the Birmingham Black Barons, the Cleveland Buckeyes, uh, the New York Black Yankees. And uh, so that's how I really got started into. And also, also not one other thing, I used to practice with them at the old Cronk Field. Okay. And uh, when I was, actually, I was like 12 years old when I started practicing with them. And uh, the thing I, I, I was so impressed with is the fact that these men all had f jobs in the factories or they had jobs at the post office. They would be at the field at 5 o'clock. They would go home, do whatever they had to do at home, and be at the field at 5 o'clock ready to practice. They just loved the game that much, and that really impressed me. Okay. Joyce, how good was Turkey Stern? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say he was... Phenomenal, fantastic, awesome. Um, he could do it all. He was a switch hitter, and I know some statistics say that his lifetime batting average was 340. But John Hallway, a historian who wrote Only the Ball Was White, uh, sent us stats that said um, 404. Um, Dad won the quadruple crown, which meant he led the Negroes Southern League in doubles, triples, home runs, and stolen bases. This feat has never been duplicated in the major leagues. That is phenomenal. And he's so good that I wrote a, one of my motivational speeches. It's called the ABCs of Norman Turkey Stearns, where I use all the letters of the alphabet, and I talk about words, uh, events, and things that happen that are associated with my dad. And what I really think is awesome, he's been inducted into five Hall of Fame. The first one was the Afro-American Sports Hall of Fame in 1987. That was followed by the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown in 2000. Uh, then there was the Michigan, they're backwards, Michigan Sports Hall of Fame in 2007, uh, Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame in 2010, and two years ago my sister Rosalyn and I went to uh, the Jerry Lloyd Conference where we were uh, singing and we went to the Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City, and they have their own Hall of Fame, um, and he's in the Cooperstown section. So, and the Tigers uh, unveiled a permanent plaque, which is at Comerica Park on the outside of Centerfield in 2007. I would say that's phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> that is phenomenal. <laughs> Did you realize as a kid, uh, just the kind of superstar status that he had, or was that something that came along later for you? 
Well, Roz and I talked a little bit about that. No, not at all. Uh, when we were growing up, he spent time with us. He, you know, he worked at Ford Motor Company, and I always forget to tell people this, for 28 years in the foundry. So he was hearing impaired at the time of um, his death, and you'll find out later that I'm, I taught the deaf and hard of hearing for 36 years, so that was a concern for me. And um, he left the house really early in the morning, so when he would come home, he would take us during the summer up to the corner store to get ice cream. So he spent time with us. But I don't remember the younger years, but when we were teenagers, um, I remember Dad talking about the home runs that he hit. But he said none of them mattered if he didn't win the game with them. So that was his concern. So he was quiet and conservative, um, very reserved. And my dad didn't brag or praise himself. So it wasn't until after his death that we realized what a phenomenal superstar we had in our life. Kevin. Let's talk a little bit about your dad. Uh, Chuck Cooper uh, was the first to uh, sign a contract. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Sweetwater was the first to, to get drafted. To get drafted. All right, but your dad was the first to actually play in yes. the NBA. October 31st, 1950. Did, did he talk to you and, and your brothers much about? that particular game and that experience? Yeah, it, it was an unpickable, 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 excuse me, experience. And the fact of him just getting there was hard. You know, didn't have, he didn't have a predecessor back in the day, in 1950. So when he got drafted, it was, you know, something real big. And I used to ask my dad, you know, when you got to camp, were you driven? And he said, man, very much so. And in 1950, they had eight, they had eight teams and 10 people on the team, which means you want to have 80 players in the whole league. And my father was drafted by the Washington Capitals. And there was nine players fighting for three positions. And my father was in here. He was, he was driven, very much so. And when he, when he got to camp, you know, my father went to West Virginia State University, a small black school in Charleston, West Virginia. When he got to camp, you know, he was, he was going against players from Georgetown, North Carolina State, University of North Carolina, Bradley, all those are heavy hitter schools. And my father said after the third day of practice, it was a wrap. It was a wrap. And he had a 10 year career. Your dad also had the experience of not just being a player, but also coaching and being part of the coaching staff. Uh, that was a real transition and a barrier breaker experience at that particular time, given our history of America. How difficult was that, and what did he learn from that experience? I, I think, personally, it, that was something big also, because my father was also the first African American assistant coach in the NBA with the Detroit Pistons. And when they give you that kind of title, they're just telling you something about, to me, about your character, what kind of person that you are, that they had that kind of trust in you. Everybody should know that they've just recently made a documentary yes. uh, about Earl Loy. Um, and so I know it's uh, making its rounds across the country and it's it's, had it, support from the NBA. So hopefully you will all see it as well. It's, 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 called, very the first, well it's called first the first to do it. And it's going to be on the big screens in late October. So everybody, please, please come see it, please. Let's talk a little bit, um, and at times it's going to be our worst enemy because we could talk for two or three hours here, but we won't wear you out like that. Um, as we look at the pros now and think back to what the pros were like then, and think about the players now, and the big salaries that they're making compared to some of the salaries that you guys weren't able to make and some of you had to have second and third jobs while you were still playing your professional sports. Um, do you think this generation understands what you all had to go through and appreciate what you did to make it so that they can do what they're doing now? The lifestyle that they have now. Yes. I would say that uh, some do. Uh, I, I do that way because when, when we had the celebrations at the stadium 
uh, uh, once uh, every year we have, uh, like in July this year, we're going to have a Negro League celebration. We've had that in the past. Uh, players like Willie, he's always a very receptive, uh, grander son. Uh, there were some other players that always came out and, and uh, like more or less uh, showed respect for the fact that we had what we'd done in the past. But there were others who uh, didn't seem to uh, feel that there, there was any, any big deal, that uh, it was just something that was going to happen. So, but, uh, so that's uh, just about the way it was. Okay. Yeah. Kevin? Yes, I just think personally that my father is just glad that he's a part of something for the kind of money these players make today. When my father played, he only made $6,000 a year. And you have players today making $25 million. And my father is a part of that. My father is the one who keeps the door open for these players to make that kind of money. Uh, you know, my father couldn't stay in hotels. My father got spit on. Uh, he got called the N-word on a regular. So he's just a part. He's history. He's history. And that's in the books. Absolutely. Joyce? I, um, my daughter... Vanessa, her, today is her 31st fourth birthday, so she was unable to attend, but she's an accomplished athlete and a basketball coach. Um, I asked her specifically about when you honor the legacy of uh, trailblazing African-American athletes, what are we doing right? And so I wanted her answer verbatim, so let me read what she said. Okay. As sports fans, we honor the trailblazers by wearing memorabilia, to reflect their greatness, attending events honoring these individuals, and talking to like-minded enthusiasts who share a passion for the old timers. But honestly, all sports fans simply need to invest in the history of the game. Right now, the sports fan base is more concerned with titles, wins, branding, and the us versus them mentality than it is with the actual game itself or the contributions of those trailblazers. The depth and richness that could be illuminated by studying the legacies lies deep within an endless vault of forgotten ball players. As fans, we need to request that these historic players are made more visible, especially to the youth. Include them in the video games, have Major League Baseball stars discussing the legendary players on social media. It also might be time to acknowledge that celebrating these greats annually is a tremendous honor, yet also sends an unintentional message that they are a part of only Negro League's history instead of Major League Baseball history or black history exclusively instead of American history. And I got to tell you, my sister and I graduated from Cass Tech. And when Cass Tech, um, no, I mentioned that because they tore the building down. And I went to the ceremony, and I wanted to get a rock for a souvenir. And I observed a black man wearing a Detroit Stars jacket. And I was really excited. So I asked him if, if he was a fan and if he knew you know, my dad. He said, no, I just like the jacket. <laughs> And, no, and so usually that's the time, because I see this all the time, I usually take time to educate, it's an educational moment, but I was so overwhelmed with disgust that I just walked away. So my point is that there are many people that wear, young people wear this athletic gear, but they know absolutely nothing about the Negro Leagues. And that same, the same thing happens when we mention our father's name a lot of times. There are so many people in Detroit that don't have a clue who my father is. Very good. Um, two final questions because I know time's our worst enemy here and hopefully if you have some other questions as we're mingling outside for the reception I'm sure all of our guests here will be amenable for you just to come up and have a conversation with them um, I think back to that famous photograph from 1967 in Cleveland, Ohio where you have athletes from, African-American athletes from all different professions standing there. Um, and that was a risky thing for many of them to do because they were speaking out um, and they weren't just talking about sports. Uh, and it was Ali and Jim Brown and many, many others. Um, and as we look at the times that we're in now uh, and controversy, whether it's America or it's international, oftentimes athletes are called upon to speak out. And some will and some don't. Um, 
as you think about past and you think about present, if you could give advice to today's athletes, what would it be? Ron? Well, I definitely think they should speak out if the, if the, if the cause is uh, worth speaking out for, they should definitely speak out and not, uh, and not uh, be afraid that, of the consequences. Kevin? I'm telling you guys, the young guys, to stay focused and stay grounded. Joyce? You have, you have a dream and you have to, you have, if you believe in something, then you have to be able to voice your opinion and take the consequences that come with it. As you remember the legacy, uh, think about the accomplishments that all of you are linked to. If you give advice to the audience, advice to fans in general, what would it be? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Okay, if you think about legacy, what you went through, the barriers that you oh, had to break, yes, um, and the young generation that's coming up today, and the sports fans today. What advice would you give? What would you say to them that why this is so important that we're all here this evening? Well, I'll tell you, I, now I was the president for the first two years when Elmer started this program. And uh, I say for two years because Elmer wore me out. <laughs> so I had I had to give up that position, and I became the treasurer. But I would, I would believe that, that, that as Elmer used to say, uh, I, I have a dream. I want to uh, complete this project uh, along with art, and I think that so. That I think if you have a dream, you have a passion about something, you should uh, do everything in your power to. Uh, uh, achieve that goal or, or uh, complete that project. Who was the best player you went up against it, or one that you remember the most? Well, there were several, uh, but one, of course, was Satchel Page. And uh, Mr. Evans mentioned uh, Cool Papa Bell and Josh Gibson, and uh, I played against them. And uh, Buck Leonard was my, probably my favorite player, but I would have to say that. Uh, Mr. Baseball was uh, Satchel Page. He, he was actually the heart of the Negro League. And, and as a player facing him, was he as good as the legend that we hear? Yeah. Well, I, I did face him I, at, at the Quinter Park. I played against him. And the first time I uh, came up the bat, I did hit a triple. Really? And the next time I came up, it naturally struck me out. <laughs> <laughs> Made you pay the price for that. <laughs> but you know, it, when, when Satchel pitched, uh, later in his career, he would only pitch a couple of innings, in exhibition games. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I only got to face him twice. Okay. And that was uh, one of the thrills of my career in baseball. Okay. Joyce, some closing thoughts? Oh, I, I, um, I wanted to tell you a uh, let me leave you with a, a positive story about the museum. Okay. Um, back in the 19, I, I taught in Detroit public schools for 13 years, 10 at the Detroit Day School for the Deaf, and then three years at Redford High School. And then I was afforded the opportunity to go and play, I mean, work in Bloomfield Hill School District. And I was the first black teacher there. And at the time, your curator here was named David Egner. And so I went, they had a traveling, in the 1990s, they had a traveling uh, Negro Leagues exhibit. And I wanted to bring my students here to be a part of that. You could come and vote. Um, they were trying to generate 75% of the vote so that my dad could be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And so I contacted Dave and I said, um, I'd like to bring my students down. And so I, at that time, you didn't have email. So I typed a letter and sent it and gave him some dates. And he, we agreed on this one date. And so we had two buses that brought us here. And when we arrived at 9.30, there wasn't another car or bus anywhere. And I thought that was strange, you know. So one of the interpreters, Paul Fugate, went to ring the bell, and a gentleman came to the door and he said, we're closed. And, because it was on a Monday. 
And I remember they are closed on Monday, but Dave had agreed for us to come on Monday, and I guess not realizing it was Monday, and I didn't think about it being Monday. So I'm aggressive. I'm not, I'm assert, no, I'm assertive. I'm not aggressive, but <laughs> there's a difference. <laughs> but on this day, I was a little aggressive. I sent, so the gentleman said, I said, well, Dave, and he signed, Paul signed to me, and I said, but he told us it was okay. So the gentleman said for him to go around to the back where the deliveries come, and so we, we did, drove the buses around, and they called David. And David opened the museum just for us to come in, and we had a tour of our stuff. So I just wanted to leave you with that. So that was a really positive Great story. memory. Kevin, uh, one of the things that struck me in the documentary that I saw that was at the DIA not too long ago about your dad was the emotion involved when they unveiled uh, the statue of him at West Virginia State. That was incredible. I think uh, my father said, beside the Hall of Fame, when they uh, unveiled the statue, it was just something big. You know, Oscar Robinson showed up, Bill Russell showed up, uh, some of his ex-teammates showed up from West Virginia State, and it was just an, an incredible moment for my dad. I mean, it was so incredible, I had tears in my eyes, seeing the joy in my father's face. Say one more thing? Yes. Um, I know Gary won't say much. Gary is the president of Friends of Historic Hamtramck Stadium, and one of the, um, I think, five remaining fields left is Hamtramck Stadium, and we need at least $1.2 million um, so that they can have young people playing different kind of sports there. And so, you know, we actually need corporate sponsorship or whoever, a CEO or whoever's rich and has money. I may not be saying it correctly, but, you know, our kids don't have, no. Growing up, we played baseball. I remember playing on, a, on the, the, our school field. We played in the alleys, and the fields were well kept. And now all of that is missing today, and a lot of the sports are not. And when I went to Bloomfield Hills, they played soccer, lacrosse, all the sports. And these were sports I never played when I was in Detroit. So we need to renovate this, this field so that kids will have these opportunities and that especially black kids will come back and play baseball again. That's right. That's very good. Absolutely. Kevin, anything that you need to tell this audience no, uh, to support thing. the documentary and make sure that just more people... Just one other thing, guys, that the United States Post Office would like to put my father on the U.S. commitment stamp. And I need 50,000 signatures. I'm at 25,000 in now, so I'm halfway there. And I got some signatures, sheets today, so I'd like everybody, you know, if you can, sign the sheet for me. Or if you got a smartphone, which I'm sure everybody has, you can go to change.org and sign online. And when you go to change.org, just tap in the Earl Lord in the box, and they come up, and all you got to do is hit your finger on the button and sign that way. And we appreciate the love, everybody. And I just want to thank everybody involved with this event today. It was just touching and, and, and incredible. Thank you Thank so you. much. Th yes, Ron. I, I would just like to say that uh, when we started this project, we had all of our meetings at the museum on West Grand Boulevard. Yeah. And uh, so actually we have more or less become a uh, full circle and now we're in this magnificent uh, building. And uh, I often think about Elmer and Dr. Wright were pretty close. And I would like to, I wish I could just could have sat in on some of the conversations. Yeah, that would have been fascinating. I bet he, I bet he, <laughs> talking to Dr. Wright, and I bet he wore him out as well. <laughs> I wish I had known him. Thank you to all three of our panelists for participating. Thank you. Thank you.